So this is uh, this is incredible. Like, word. Once again, my my story kind of is the same thing. Let, let, let me first say uh, my rebuttal to Shahid. God does have a sense of humor. He made DJ Maceo. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Word. Uh, yeah, 1989, man. Uh, three feet high and rising. Once again, like, I'm 19 years old, like, can't believe what I'm hearing. It's like, what, what, what? what y'all are talking to me. This isn't like listening to the message. I knew all the words to the message at nine, 10 years old, but I didn't know what none of that meant. But something about this cut right here, which I bet y'all didn't know, this the man that produced it. Tell me about that record, man. Like, how old were you when you did that? I was, I was actually 15 years old when I was playing around with it on the sampler. I had um, a, a Casio SK1 sampler I bought from Wiz Records and Tapes. And um, nobody beats the Wiz. Had the little four orange pads on it. Now you can play with the s different samples. You can sample four different compositions. And um, you had to put it up to the speaker. There was no input to get real audio. So I put it up to the speaker to get the sound I was trying to catch. Took forever to do, you know. But when I finally got it, it was on. Put it down to the four track. We only really had three tracks to really work with but put it down to the four track. And I sat on it since 1985, I was 15. And um, I was working with a different artist at that time, a different rapper at that time. It was my uncle's best friend, lived around the corner. Uh, he went to school, my uncle went to school, actually graduated high school with him. They uh, graduated high school with him and Prince Paul. And um, <laughs> and uh, I had moved to Long Island around 84. So 85, things started really kind of picking up behind DJing and playing basketball around the neighborhood. Um, Brooklyn cats, we just get everywhere, you know. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, where, where Ali's from. Um, and uh, trying to do that song for the other rapper, he didn't like it just as much as my group don't like it as well. Um, he didn't like it. Paul th always thought it was cool, but it wasn't his project. We were both called on to a project. Me as a, just a new cat with new energy, and Paul as the senior around the neighborhood who was doing this thing with Stetsasonic already. And the person that signed the rapper, I don't want to say his name, you know, but the person that signed the, the rapper, my uncle's friend, he was my music teacher. He uh, taught at Amityville Junior High School and high school. He also wrote for Surface and he wrote for the Isley Brothers. And he saw the, the surgeons of hip hop growing at that period in time. So he started an independent label and wanted to put this guy out. We did a covered version of um, God, not God made me funky, seven minutes of funk. It was whack, really, really whack. <laughs> really, really, really whack. Really, really, really whack. Paul and I are really connected behind this project. We went out in the car, like, had it been like two, three in the morning, one session, spending so much time working on one record. And he truly asked me, how did I feel about this? I was like, yo, man, I really don't like it. I was like, I even told them I don't like it. But at 15, this was my opportunity to go to the studio, go f further than the four track, you know, 
and embark upon my dream, you know. Um, it wasn't working for me, it wasn't working for Paul, and that's where we really connected at that point. And I was like, I really got some other stuff I want to play for you. And that was the stuff I had been working on with, I call him David Merce, y'all. You know, you know him as True Goy and Pasta Noose. David's True Goy, Pasta Noose is Merce. These are my childhood friends. Um, they were closet MCs. <laughs> no one knew they rap. No one. Um, Pas actually used to DJ a little something. Dave used to do the human beatbox. They used to be part of another group called Easy Street, like a year prior to us really connecting. And Dave wrote the rhymes for everybody. So did Pas, but Pas DJed. And Dave was the human beatbox. And he was really good. Uh, the turn of the guards came 85. Summer school. We was all going to summer school. Uh, the, summer, the school was right across the street from my house. So we were done with class like by 11 a.m. So we piling up at my house. Uh, we got together behind a mutual friend who was a fourth member of the group. Can't mention his name either. Sorry, folks. <laughs> But he was the fourth member. He was actually the person who brought us all together. We had this idea of really, um, when we heard Ultra Magnetic, and I have to also say when we saw Dougie Fresh and the Get Fresh crew, and Slick Rick was, it was featuring MC Ricky D at the time. And um, we was like, wow, a four-man group, two DJs, Chill Will, Barry B. That's who me and the other cat was like. We was like our own version of Chill Will and Barry B. But he became pretty obnoxious, something that, someone that didn't fit the fold and wound up exiting himself out. Paul didn't want to work with him either, you know, but when it all came together, he was out the picture. Uh, Paul told us to come to the studio, actually come by his house. And we had a meeting. Once I played him the demos, he was like, this is everything I've been trying to do with Stead. So I would like for y'all to come by my house and let's talk about this. First thing he said out the gate, we could definitely take this to the studio and clean it up. I can't make anybody any promises. I don't know if you're going to get a deal or not. But this is definitely something I'm into creatively. He was playing me all the stuff that he was doing with Stead. And then when I played him the stuff we were doing, he played me some stuff he submitted for Stet that was getting turned down, completely up our alley. You know, we hooked up. The guys was kind of nervous because here it is. They never rap publicly, never, until this point in time linking up with Paul. Me, I've been DJing since I was six years old. I've been carrying records and speakers for other DJs trying to get my time to shine at a block party. And... I would catch it. Um, 12 years old, I got my first shot on um, Woodbine between Wilson and Knickerbocker in Bushwick. That was my first shine, 12 years old, being able to DJ a block party, you know. And since then, you know, prior to that, the best party I ever did was my mom's housewoman party. <laughs> that was off the chain. I got to stay up crazy late, so I DJ. You know, so I was that was off the hook. '82, like, you know, that was a great year. That was like, I felt like my induction into hip hop. I, I felt like I'm a part of this. I started meeting certain people. You know, Stephanie Mills didn't live too far. You know, so, and she was into hip hop. They was going to see Grandmaster Flash, places I couldn't go to. You know, and I was knowing, like, people like her on a first-name basis. Gwen Guthrie, you know, I got to meet her before she passed, you know, which I met her in Quad Studios. That's how long Quad Studios have been around. I met her when I was, like, 14, you know. So, and I mean, like, Miss Guthrie, but she was like, honey, call me Gwen, you know. And that was, like, real moments for me. And then I made my first $300 DJ, and I felt like I was in the business. I'm in. And I'm good. hold up, three hundred dollars at what year was this? Uh, my first three hundred dollars DJ, and it was um, eighty four. No, eighty five, Long Island. It was in Long Island. Cool G Rap came to the party. You know, it was um, 
you know, he had just came out with It's a Demo mm. and all of that. So he was getting around. Actually, Polo had some, DJ Polo had some family in our neighborhood. So they were coming to all the backyard parties. You know, every rapper was showing up to cookouts. That was the thing. You know, hip hop for us was on the weekend. Even on a mainstream level, it was only on the weekend. Mm. If you caught it any other part of the week, it was late night with the Supreme team. And if your mother caught you up, you get you in trouble. <laughs> so, you know, Supreme Team or Mr. Magic or even um, Dr. Dre from Original Concept, um, Big Dr. Dre. Right. Um, uh, th these were our outlets for hip hop. You know, if we didn't catch Red or Chuck Chill Out or Molly on the weekend, and it was really late at night or wee hours in the morning. And everybody came out to Long Island to college parties to promote whatever they were doing. And when I saw G Rap at a party I was DJing, I was like, I'm on. He came up to me, you know, said, What's up? I obviously was doing something, right? He was feeling me. He said, What's up? Prince Marky D, another one that was coming around early on. So these are people I got familiar with at a very young age before I even was even thinking about record deal, more so thinking about getting ready for the weekend. You know, and um, my connection with Paul and hearing Rakim come out, hearing Ultra Magnetic, of course, Run DMC, that's when us as a collective said we wanted to really take this serious and make records. We were already playing around making demos, but to actually want to get out there and pursue this as a dream, it was those groups. It was really Ultra Magnetic. Ultra magnetic. That was like the catalyst to wanting to be different and speak your own language, you know. And let alone they had, they still had the hardcore Bronx image, but Cool Keith was on something else, man, you know. And that was the inspiration to be like, yeah, we're gonna be different. We we're gonna come up with our own language, you know. We're gonna make you believe what we believe, you know. Strictly Dan Stucky. Yeah. And Strictly Dan Stucky just mean, yo, that shit is fresh. <laughs> it's fresh. <laughs> Around that time, uh, with Three Feet High and Rising, there was another particular song that, I mean, me, myself, and I, clearly is a song that put y'all on the map. Yes. But there's a classic on that album, and... For that time period, like to understand that that album had more tracks than I think any other album in history, as far as I knew. Like well, that was well, to be ridiculous. honest, the record that truly put us on the map was Potholes in My Lawn. Well, yeah, yeah. That was the record that put us on the map. That yeah. was the first video, yeah. you know, first introduction into mainstream culture. Right. Plug tuning got us love in New York. And the name De La Soul got us love with the Latino community. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody thought I was either Dominican or Puerto Rican. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, but, but it was potholes in my lawn. Right. And Jennifer had played a big role in that also. Because yeah. that was bouncing off of Jungle Brothers' Jim Browski. Yeah. Jenny was like the answer to Jim Browski. Right. So that really what put Well, I say, I say that for me because living in D.C., Virginia areas, like I knew those songs, but it was me, myself, and I that got the general public knowing. Because I think that video and that song probably got more play than Potholes may have. May have you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it did. You it know, did. but there's also another song that I want to talk, uh, play right now that y'all probably didn't know he had something to do with this. I want to ask a question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Salutations, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the art of the posse cut? This particular song had so many, like, this was the epitome of collaboration at that point in time. To where we are today, how music, it, people collaborate with each other, other artists collaborate with each other, but it now seems to be like, yo, B, I got this beat. 
I'm gonna pass you this Pro Tools, you know what I'm saying? Spit 16 on there, get back to me. It's contrived. Right. People, talk about talk about the process of Buddy. Um, it was a natural process. Um, I did the beat, and we just had been really just sitting on it. I honestly just happened to walk in the studio one day, and to the right of me was Mike G with a pad. Pa sitting at the mixing desk. And Africa's in the mic booth. I just walked in. And dudes is laying rhymes to my beat. You know, I have to take a page from Shahid. That's God, man. You know, um, making that happen like that. I just thought it was a cool track. I thought it fit what we were doing. And um, didn't expect it to be that. You know, later come Q-Tip. Like, you know, it was, that was that day. And we all had really just met. Like a week prior to that, we did a show with Jungle. Uh, Boston, somewhere in Boston. We had been running to each other periodically. Excuse me, excuse me. Guinness is hitting me. Right before, right before we um, came out with Plug Tuning, we used to go to uh, Latin Quarters a lot. And um, everybody at that time was wearing something different or doing something different, especially if you was an up and coming artist. You did something that signature yourself. We made these plug clocks. The clock thing was always something that was like, I mean, Flavor definitely took it to the next level. But wearing the clock, wearing the pouches, that was something that was going on in New York. Just Flavor epitomized it. And um, we kind of snatched that a little bit. We had these plug clocks and we had the plug logo. And we were wearing that to the club and we would wear these sequence outfits, the Gumby haircut. We just looked different from everybody who was rocking Kangos or whatever. We looked crazy. Africa sorted us out. Red sorted us out. Of course, Paul introduced us to everybody. But when everybody got hit with the record, it was really more, that added the extended excitement. You know, Africa was like, wow, you know, we like, like minds. We kind of on the same thing. And we were like, yes, we are. We love the Jungle Brothers. You know, that was that moment of communication over the music. Then the show came about. Then the invitation to the studio. Mind you, I didn't know they were going to be in the studio. I walk in. Mike with a pad, Africa in the booth, Paz had the board, Q-Tip comes later, and we do that. We got this song called Buddy, you know. And then we start once once the song was done. Immediately we start to perform it. I hadn't even met Ali yet. That was the thing. I myself I hadn't met him yet. I was still in school. Here it is. Sorry y'all, but um, I got left back because I cut school to record Three Feet High and Rising. So I wound up graduating a year later than everybody else. <laughs> Pass had already graduated, Dave had already graduated, and the opportunity kept coming to make this record. I truly was getting ready to head to the military. I was involved with a lot of street culture that just, I wasn't very happy with doing myself, so I was really about to go to the military. And I said, if I'm gonna die somewhere, let me go get some medals and die, let me not die on these streets around here, you know. But the creator is who he is, man. You know, this opportunity kept coming. The gut feeling kept hitting. You need to do this, you know. Um, even my last year, I was got, they talked me into playing football. I quit playing football because the dream was clicking. Every time I looked up, it was clicking. And I managed it somehow. I was going to the club, meeting up with the fellas, then next thing you know, getting off the train, going straight to school. You know, my mom didn't have a clue what was going on. You know, everything was definitely chaotic. Come on, 17, 18, you're trying to figure yourself out. You know, you, you are going through these quote unquote identity crisis, you know, trying to figure out who you are as a teenager, you know. And, but with this opportunity presenting itself, it was scary, but we pursued it. Pass dropped college. Dave dropped college. Here it is. I'm fumbling with high school. But my intentions was always to finish, which I did, you know. Um, 
we did the album all through 88. Guys waited for me to finish before we really hit the road. I'll never forget Leon Russell coming up to the school, uh, t you know, discussing my situation and presenting all of this, uh, you know, this press and everything that, you know, how well things were taken off. And mind you, there was a major even improvement in my grades. And I was tired. I used to miss, like, my first three periods. And mind you, behind missing my first three periods, I even had to go to night school. I did all of that just to finish high school and pursue this dream. But it was, it was a scary time, but amazing at that point in time. Kids just following their dreams and not sure where this thing is going to go. You know, even when you're talking to the label and they're going, yo, this is really great effort, but we don't expect it to do well. You know, we love this kind of music. You know, that's one thing I can say about Tommy Boy. Great place to create. It was, a, you know, next to all the, every label's whack, but this was the best of the worst, how I feel, you know. And, um, we had our freedom, but they didn't anticipate any success. And I thought, yeah, okay, after the release of this Three Feet High Rise, and I'm going to the service, you know. But right after graduation, I was on tour with LL Cool J, NWA, Public Enemy, Too Short, Hammer, 357. The list goes on. It was like the whole hip hop ensemble. You know, everybody that existed in hip hop and that was somebody, you know, whether you had the hottest record out there at that time with no sales or you had the sales, everybody was on that tour. And that ticket would be like $20. $20. $20. Now it's like $100 plus. But it, was, but it was for one act <laughs> at that. All of these acts and ticket would be like $20. Arenas would be packed. You know, it was... It was a milestone in my life, really, next to going on tour with Tribe. Word. So that particular album uh, also brought y'all a lesson with uh, sample clearance. And I know you spoke on this on a documentary that uh, I had the pleasure of working on called Copyright Criminals. If y'all haven't seen it, y'all should check it out. Um, speak on what that did to the whole soundscape of music, what that... It created scene. a new business. Definitely, um, you know, sampling became a significant business. You know, um, when we first released our first debut, we followed all the, requirement, all the requirements to hand in sample clearances and make sure things were dealt with. Tommy Boy was in control of the administration. All we had to do was fill out the forms and hand them in. But they were in control of the administration, so they felt like certain things like transmitting live from Mars was insignificant to clear because it was such a, just a small skit. Who's going to really pay attention to something so silly as that? Well, that was the very first thing that came to bite us. There was a, a public lawsuit out there from the Turtles for a million dollars. We settled out of court for 50000 Due to uh, miscommunication, uh, whatever the shuffle was, we ended up going half with Tommy Boy on the, the bill. But um, when it comes to sample clearances, you're always at the mercy of the negotiation, whoever owns the rights to it. There was a point in time where different people didn't want you to sample. Like a, There was a time Anita Baker didn't want anybody to touch her stuff. George Benson didn't want anybody to touch their stuff. Steely Dan didn't want it, anybody to touch his stuff, but he didn't realize we touched his stuff. That's how obscure we were doing things as well. Now he didn't even realize that we used his record, but we made it clear. Because at the same time, we are a fan of the people that we sampled from. A lot of that music we truly are into. We grew up on that. You know, so to want to give the proper credit, that's something we aspire to do. But by the label not doing their just, we get hit with the legalities. 
the end of the day, everybody liked the fact that you're a fan, but business is business. What was the, uh, what was it like the day you met George Clinton? Oh, another milestone. One of my heroes in music. I mean, to know that I'm a big Parliament Funkadelic fan. I've went to the concert in 1976. My uncle and my mom took me and my brother to watch the mothership land at the Madison, at Madison Square Garden. 20 years later, I'm in Central Park relanding the mothership with George Clinton. It's amazing. Another, and I had broke my leg that year. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to that show. I'm going to be on that stage, and I'm going to be part of landing that mothership. Because to be at that concert when I was six years old and then turn around when I was 26, to be actually invited to be a part of that, that was, it was, it was great, you know. And then George became, like, a really good friend, you know. Like, that's Uncle George, straight up. You know, and him and he and I like had a lot of good times, man. Like, I won't smoke no weed with him, though. Because <laughs> you don't know what's in the blunt. <laughs> so no, so no. He had the nerve to look at me and said, you young bloods need to stop smoking that chronic. That shit's too strong. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> True story, true story, I'm telling you. When we did the Frank 151 thing, and I was talking to him, oh man, he said, you and Snoop, y'all need to stop this shit here. This shit is too strong. I was like, are you serious? All the shit you do. <laughs> he said, they ain't have it like this back in our day. I was like, I, I get you, I feel you. I'm not messing with you in your day, though. You own that day, we own this day, and that's our separation right there. <laughs> Ooh. Man, uh, on the production tip, man, like, once again, you kind of have a similar uh, story and situation like Ali back in them days, a lot of the, with the group efforts, looking at production-wise, we wouldn't have known who actually produced certain cuts because maybe how Ali was saying that you were trying to, you know, make the brand stand out in that sense. Yeah, I, I, I concur with with Shaw and that. I mean, the common goal was to be a group and um, to do everything to catapult the group. Um, I don't know if it's like that for Shaw, but that was something I noticed Jay doing with Run DMC. Although the group was Run DMC and Jam Master Jay, but he represented Run DMC, and to even hear them even turn the turn around and address Run DMC, the brand, the name, more as a group instead of just two rappers, Run and D. They address it more as a group. And that still st stands today because here it is. Jay's not here. And Run DMC is not here. And that was a conscious decision and effort on their end to dissolve the group because their main man, who they felt held it together, is not here. You know, so the common goal was to be that. We know there was no hidden agenda. There was no... I'm trying to do a solo thing. No disrespect, but it wasn't a brand newbie situation. You know, all of those guys initially looked to do solo efforts, but then came together to do a group, you know. Um, and we know Pooba come from other situations. He come from Master's Ceremony. So, different thing. It, the common goal was, was to be a group, always to be a group. And, and that still is the goal. And it's a incredible testament with y'all, and in my opinion, I say this because y'all are clearly, out of 
all the groups in hip hop from that era, like y'all are like undefeated. Like every album has been incredible. Y'all are what, 23 years high and rising now? Never it's broke up. Something like that. <laughs> never broke up and never, no one's ever pursued solo situations. Like it, you remained a group and that's something that needs to be. And it's not no fairy tale. It's a gift and curse. You know, it's, I call it the gift and curse because something that is you recognize to be so great, it's really hard to pull together. Not everybody's on the same page at the same time. You know, um, especially when you're in a, when your role is, cons when your role is, when you know your role and people around you <laughs> look at it to be powerful, but in some respects I'm powerless because I can't rap for him. I can't rap for him. You know, I can't make him like a certain beat, you know. I don't know when the stars are lining up for him today to want to make music. So I got to be patient. And then being patient, yeah, the clock of business is ticking because now our childhood dream is a full-fledged career. And we can't really operate like this anymore, you know. But that's the curse. <laughs> that's the true curse. But when it finally connects... And if you notice, De La, come on, we don't put out records as consistent. You know, um, the true, you know, this is, you're dealing with true artists. You can't rush art. You know, if the painting ain't right, can't put it out yet. There's something missing. Don't quite know what that is, but when it hits me, it's going, I'm going to put it up there, and then I'm going to put it out. I'm not quite comfortable with it. So... I don't care what deadline the corporation has, you know? And trust me, I could sit here and be a hypocrite to what I'm saying because I understand the duality of the relationship. There's music business and then there's music art, and I'm playing both sides of the fence, you know? Um, shoot, as the one in the group who had way more responsibilities than everybody else, I'm like, we gotta get this paper, man. <laughs> You know, but um, you just can't rush the art. So, you know, when it comes down to it, the ultimate curse is that you got to wait for the art to be solidified and not everybody's on the same page. So it's that waiting process to really continue to pursue the magic. It's a nice uh, way to segue into this next cut that uh, you happen to produce. Taking a train, taking a train. Salutations, salutations, salutations. That was a uh, a sure shot banger right there, and um, you know, shameless plug. Thank y'all for uh, for repping repping OG Fro T-shirt in that video. <laughs> That uh, kind of it was hot, man. Kind of <laughs> set it off, you know what I'm saying? Like, respect, respect, you know. Uh, you you have such a a character about you that we kind of got to live out through a lot of these albums. And then you had your time when you started to do your own thing. You started an independent record label, Bear Mountain. And what was it about that time in your life that made you realize that it was time to take another creative endeavor helping other artists, which y'all seem to already do anyways, because y'all put on so many, you put us on to so many different artists, you know, from the most deaths to the be a buddy with Latifah and, and Moni Love and. I mean, although. Fife was a part of a Tribe Called Quest. First record he rapped on was Buddy Remix. So, you know, um, those are just other blessings again, man. Like, 
these people coming into your life, you know, God presenting these people in your life and you develop something with them, you know. Um, for me, <coughs> definitely getting past the third album, definitely tainted with the business. My innocence is gone. Not really all that inspired. The true inspiration always came out of who was fresh and new and never embarked upon the business. That one cat, two cats who just real hot and got a dream, you know? And um, the one thing Paul said to me a long time ago, like, especially for where I come from, like, I love what I do because I could have literally been, I could have been a stick-up kid. I could have been a lot of, I was pretty good at the streets. I was pretty good. I, I think I knew whatever I put my mind to, I would be good at. That's just truly it. If I really put my mind, and, and, and New York life presents such a hustle, especially when you come from a single parent home and your mom's is on and off welfare, you know, we dealing with the warranted struggles. And I'm the oldest child, and I'm trying to figure out how to help my moms out. You know, and I could have been that cat. I could have been that cat on uh, America's most gangsters, best gang. I could have been that cat for real deal, you know. <laughs> but God pushed me in a different place. You know, I knew I never, first of all, I, I love my mother to death. I never wanted to disappoint her, you know. So although I, whatever I did in the streets, I tried to make sure she never found out, you know. And then when I was getting too heavy, with it, <laughs> I would tell her. I would tell her. That would be my moment of repent. So really, to answer your question, Paul put me on, man. Big up to Prince Paul all day. If I haven't been in my relationship with Paul, I could have been somewhere else. And um, I asked Paul, yo, what could I ever really do to repay you? He said two things. He said, yo, have some experiences that I never had with this hip-hop thing. And then two, turn around and do the same thing for somebody else that I'm doing for you. Word, word up, word up. So, like uh, Ali and Tribe, y'all also had uh, experience with Jay Dilla. King, he's a true king. For and real. you know, since this is Dilla month, and y'all are gonna rock in his honor tonight at Boombox. Why don't you speak on Dilla? Like, what was that meeting like? How did that come about? Jay Dilla. I think we all met him around the same time. If I can really recall, I think Dave was the first to meet him, but introduced him to Q-Tip. They met in the mall somewhere in the in Detroit somewhere. I think um, Dilla had already been working with Farside at this point though. And he was still an unknown, but he was working with Farside because um, he was putting his name down as JD, not Dilla. Right. So you could get it confused with Jermaine Dupri, you know? Not really, but yeah. <laughs> well, at, at, at that point in time, if you didn't know, you would be like, at that point in time, if you really didn't know, could you be like, yo, same dude that produced uh, Criss Cross? You know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> Pre-Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-Wikipedia. Like, Cliff Notes. <laughs> but, you know, um, really meeting him and connecting. Uh, my, my first time really chilling, chilling with Dilla like having my real moment where we smoked out and we kicked it, like, you know, cause when we, when we around my crew, when we around tribe, sometimes you gotta, it's like you be, you would, with the pastors of church, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, you know. <laughs> so, you know, we never really got loose. And the studio atmosphere has always been a real, that's our playground. That's where we really take the work serious. You know, everybody's truly into the art. But I got to go to the crib a few times and hang out with him in his own world. After an OK Player show or anytime I came to the D, hung out with Frank and Dank. 
and we really kicked it, man. We talked about, you know, a lot of times, man, when you get with people you really love and you care for, everything ain't always good. So you want to, there's times you want to let it out, man. You know, he want to tell his Q-tip story. I want to tell my day lot story. There's times when I get, we got with Ali, we done sat in the car many days and many nights and shared our bad stories of our camps, you know. And that's just your moment to vent. And you know when you built family with somebody, you can share this moment and they know what you're saying. You don't mean no malice to who, you, who you're talking about, you know. You just venting. And you venting out of love because you want to continue what you're doing and who you're doing it with. But there's that moment where, like, every family fight, man, is truly what it is. Like, there's not no, no fairy tale. We truly are family because you can see in the tribe movie, you can obviously see that, you know. And um, for some reason with the tribe, I've been, to every, I've been in, in the middle of every fight. I don't know why me. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> One love. <laughs> Peace. Appreciate it. But um, that's family for you. And my moment with JD was like, it was with JD and Frank and Dick. And, and here it is, JD. This, the, this was the one moment he really wanted to like vent and like bark a little bit. I'm like, yo, B, I'm going to help you find your tongue. Because you think I ain't going to really feel you on this. And I dropped everything he was feeling, what was going on in the tribe situation with Q-Tip. And he kept looking back to Frank and Dank going, do you hear this nigga? <laughs> do you hear him? Preach, preach, Mace, please preach. You're telling my soul right now. I was like, let's smoke out and let's just let it out, B. You know what I'm saying? Because the only way you're going to be able to, to continue to be inspired and do what you do and do it with who you love doing, you got to get that off your chest. And it's just, it's a cliche, but you got to keep it real. It's a true cliche, but you got to keep it real. Not only with your folks, but with yourself. Because you're not going to move forward. And the reason why I think he, he still is great, because he's been able to be real with himself you know, and real with the situations around him. And I think in our final days of Dilla and hearing him talk, you know, we all felt that. We all felt that interview on that tape. We felt that. And it was true. It was honest, man. And he's the greatest, man. You know, he, he brought something to hip hop. And that's, that's the thing about this. Like, I, I get upset when I see cats constantly just taken from it. Taken, 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 and give nothing back. Yo, he gave something to hip hop in a major way, you know, and he definitely helped carry De La Soul past the tradition of by the time you make your third album, your career is going to be over. Well, he helped us beat the odds. Word up. You're good at this, man. It's a, it's a, it's a good segue. Y'all will get enough of that tonight at Boombox. You know what I'm Jay saying? Y'all get enough of that tonight at Boombox. You know what I mean? don't know if Ali got that in his set, but it's in mine. <laughs> <laughs> word, word. Oh, uh, yeah, man. Uh, what's what's driving you now, like creatively? Always the new talent. The new talent always drives me. I like the innocence, man. Like, you know, this is something that just happened just yesterday. I met Mac Miller yesterday for the first time, and I've been watching this kid. Actually, my sons put me on the Mac Miller. My 19-year-old and my 14-year-old put me on the Mac Miller. They was like, Daddy, you gonna like him. And, you know, and they into the Little Waynes and all of that, and, you know, they definitely into modern day hip hop, you know. Um, but by being around me, their understanding is getting a lot more broader. My 19 year old has truly matured. He went from 
Lil Wayne being his favorite rapper to now Lil Wayne and Big Daddy Kane as his favorite rapper, you know? So, and, 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 and Buster got a personal, got a favorite, got a spot with him too. Like, something about Buster, my 19 year old, really loves him, you know? He's been loving Buster since he was like eight, you know? Um, but yeah, um, these are the, the new talent, man. Uh, new talent has always been the drive for me from the days of most, from the days of Black Sheep, from, you know, everybody that was fresh that came through. And um, we always challenge the creative envelope. Check your ego out the door and let's really do what we do. If I want to continue to be Maceo out here, how everybody perceive me, well, Vincent Mason got to come up in and really do, a, do his job, you know, along with Kelvin Mercer and David Jolicoeur and, you know, Come on, Fareed and everybody else. <laughs> but we check our egos out the door and we really get down to challenging each other creatively and 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 not canceling out no idea. Every idea is a is a great idea. You have to try it. You know, you don't know until you really try it. And do not cancel it out until you actually put it up there to go, okay, it looks good or, or it sounds good, you know. Or it sounds bad. You got to put it up. Got to put it out there. You know, it's more than just verbally conveying it. Because not everybody can see what you're saying. So you have to show it. And we all gave ourselves that respect. And that's what I always liked about our creative space. But like I say again, the new talent. The new talent drives the hell out of me. That innocence, man. And I uh, also wanted to touch on... Uh the collaboration that you did, or I should say y'all did with uh, with the Gorillas. You didn't really say much. <laughs> but it carries that song. That's God, again. It's and we've truth. heard that laugh, like, Yo, this laugh, man, is my laugh. And I used to get teased for it. I got a lot of fights behind this laugh. <laughs> Seriously. And um, I just, it's me, so I, I learned to embrace it, you know. Um, I can't change who I am. So, and I'm not trying to, you know. But I think at them, them teenage years, yeah, you, you self-conscious about a lot. So I pound a lot of people upside their head for this laugh. <laughs> but now I, I love it. I love, what, I love the impression it has on people, you know. Um, I like making people happy, man. So if my silliness brings joy, cool, because I like being silly. I like being fun. I like telling jokes. And honestly, I really am a jokester. I, my, my comedy comes free, because if you got to pay for it, it ain't funny. <laughs> And as this is my natural, just me being me, the class clown, but I got my grades, you know? And I, that was my way of playing possum to everybody because I believe we all can have a good time with what we love to do, you know? 90% of the world is doing something they hate doing for a living. They never even went to school for what they're doing for a living. And I'm part of the 10%, you know? So I'm going... I'm going to do my best to bring joy to the 90% that hate what they're doing, you know? So we've come to that point where we're going to open up the, the floor for questions. Let's see. Uh... Hey, Mace. Hey, Asya. How you doing? How, How you doing? I have a question I've always wanted to ask you. So you mentioned that Dilla's music was stolen. And we all know that a lot of people will take and not really give. And he only really became a legend after he passed. What can we do to commemorate artists so that we don't have to wait until they pass in order to make them of legendary status? We have to support them while they're here. We have to. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Like, we have to give them the glory when they're on this earth. Why do we acknowledge them when they're dead and gone? I can never understand that myself. We definitely need to give them the glory when they're here on this earth, when they're doing tremendous work. But for some reason, we take that for granted, 
for some reason, jealousy and envy prevails when a person is alive, but when they finally die, then we have this sentiment, and then we want to merit them. But, I, 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 you know, we live in a world that's controlled by the devil, you know. So the earth is controlled by the devil. So, you know, he puts, he's, he's just as strong as the creator. They're brothers, man, you know. And he'll put these weary moments around you every now and again. You know, when Dilla was alive, there was a lot of, I witnessed a lot of, envious people and I feel like envy is worse than jealousy because you can never really detect it till the very last moment and it's too late you know and there was a lot of people really envious of him because he's just that good and that great and if you know your bible Jesus was great but he had to go somewhere else to receive his greatness and then come back for his people to acknowledge his greatness and Dilla had to go to the spiritual realm for us to acknowledge his greatness. I'm glad I was able to be a part of the disciples to acknowledge it while he was here on earth. I'm down by law. <laughs> Salute. Salute. Salutary. Salutations. Salutations. <laughs> so, uh, Maceo, I grew up listening to De La Soul, uh, K-Day. I remember listening to you guys on K-Day when I was in high school. So, yeah, 1580 K-Day AM. So, Greg Mack, the Mixed Masters and all that stuff. Do you remember the first, uh, when you first heard that you guys were played, playing over here in L.A. in the West Coast, and what was your first show that you performed here in L.A.? My first show in L.A.? was some skating rink. I can't remember the name of it. World on Wheels. World, on Wheels. Word up. Word up. All I got to say is I was scared like a mother because it was gang banger city, B. Crips and Bloods all day. Yo, for real? I mean, I, I mean, in, in, I mean, gang culture doesn't really grew mainstream. It's crazy. Gang culture grew really mainstream. Like, and um, here it is in New York. We didn't have that at the time. We have that now. We didn't have, we had, it wasn't called gangs. It was called your crew, you know? And that word extended pretty dynamic. It could have been thugged out. It could have been a rap group. It could have been a crew of dancers. But out here, it was really Gangs, like for real, like. And, and one thing I noticed with quote unquote gangs in on the East Coast, especially New York, primarily, dudes would thug out for money, like they would rob you. You know, it was about economics. If I'm gonna hurt somebody, I gotta get something out of it. I'm really gonna go in to cast this check on this person. <laughs> Out here? No, I'm going to kill for my set. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow your head off because you don't speak like me. You know? What set you claim? Huh? What? I didn't understand any of that, really. And, you know, having on the wrong color. That threw me off. You know, and I believe, man, my ignorance is what saved me at the time, truly, because it was hardcore gangbanging back then. Seriously, like, you come through. I was scared coming out of L.A. I mean, I'm glad I made friends with the Booyah tribe early. <laughs> early. Word up. Because, yo, for real, when I come out, they think I'm Samoan or something like that anyway. So I made friends with the Booyah tribe early in the game. And, and y'all used to wear a lot of crazy colors. Yeah, we wore the colors and the, the medallions, so it was all, I was right in, you know. And Booyah used to hold me down every time, seriously. Mason Town, word. <laughs> Who's got the mic? Yeah. Yeah, first I want to say uh, thanks for Daylight for being themselves, creating their own language in the hip-hop game. But uh, I got a question about Long Island, as far as like uh, groups, MCs that came out. Um, who originated like the first, uh, I guess you could say, quote-unquote, Long Island flow? Because to my knowledge, it's like, 
JVC force, EPMD, so. There's no real Long Island flow. There's no real Long Island flow, cause um, you, <laughs> come on, Chuck D from Long Island. None of us sound like him, you know what I mean? Like, so I don't know what that is, you know. One thing I can credit Long Island for is rappers using their real names. Eric Sermon, Paris Smith, Keith Murray, Craig Mack. You know what I'm saying? Seriously. <laughs> That's, you know, unless you was 5% of like Rakim, you know what I mean? But everybody did use their real names for the most part, you know. You know, like Kurt Cazell, Curtis, you know what I mean? From JVC Force, you know. So, I, I don't know what the Long Island flow is, though. I, you got me on that one. Okay. You f you from Long Island? No, oh, Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know what the Long Island flow is. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yo, yo. Here we go, yo. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about the song "Buddy." I know um, Puffy came along later talking about how they invented the remix. But if I'm correct, I think. Buddy was one of the first remixes that was ever done. Actually, the first real remix in hip hop was Me, Myself, and I. Okay. Where it was completely different music altogether from the original. Not like a, a dub of the, like the bridge. Molly did the bridge is over. Right. It wasn't like a dub mix. It was an actual remix where the music was completely different. I know Puffy likes to take credit for that. You know, that's all for the cameras and for the press, but people in hip hop know what it really is. And he's in hip hop, and he know what it really is. Exactly. So, you know. And can you explain Buddy? Because I know Prince Paul said something else in that video, but it didn't correlate to what Buddy sounded like in the song. <laughs> Buddy is, um, it's another way of saying my friend, my dear friend, <laughs> my close friend. My friend to the end, you know. You know, my loved one, you know, someone you spend and spend time boo. with, you know. That's my boo. Yeah, my boo boo. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. Thank you, man. Thank you. you know what? Method Man likes the original. That really touched me, man. Where he was like, I like the original, buddy. I was like, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Peace, thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, speaking of Method Man, I just want to know how the Red Man track, Ooh, came along. Like, how that came about, actually. Everybody that we worked with, especially after, I, I, I gotta say, you know, I give it to my guys on the lyrical tip, and when it, you know, us collectively, when we think about people want to work with, but when, when the lyrics start to come together and add that extra added instrument. The vocal has always been another instrument to us. You know, the, the cadence, the melody of the vocal, and then also who else you hear on the track. Like, that's how we always built our collaborations. We didn't say we're gonna really consciously work with this person, you know. Um, you, you, of course you wanna work with everybody, you know, but sometimes it just don't come together like that, you know. I've been wanting to work with Raphael for years, but it's about the right song, right track. You know, the, 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 especially when you truly care about your art. I want to make a record that's going to complement us both and create something completely new for us and Redman or whoever that person may be. Our style's coming together to create a whole new style. It's not just about a feature. It's truly about doing a collaboration and bringing everybody in the creative fold. And, and, and when you call somebody like Redman, he's thrown off because he's like, they were thinking of me? You know, like, everybody looked to meet the challenge, especially if you really, it's, it's an unspoken. If you into hip hop like you say you into hip hop, you gonna meet certain challenges. And Redman met the challenge, Buster met the challenge. Everybody, you know, it was definitely a natural thing. Slick Rick, that was the most incredible, I felt, record we've made. I didn't know how we were going to do that. I always felt like Ricky was going to outshine us. 
out the door. But it came together. Then even to turn around and make a record with Be Real. How are we going to do that? Is it just going to be Mason Be Real? Because they're the only ones who smoke weed. But the concept came together. The concept was so ill. Us, myself, and Be Real trying to get Poss to smoke weed, who never smoke weed. Ghost. And calling this weed. Calling a song peer pressure. You know? Where's comedic at one point, you know, the dual message, you know? Where the dual message. You don't have to smoke weed to be cool, you know? And then everybody who smoke weed ain't bad people or stupid. <laughs> you know? By having Maceo and Be Real and Pasta Noose brings a certain message to weed smoking and the person who choose not to smoke weed, you know? And it, ha and it was very comedic at the same, and hip hop at the same time. And a true, true, true collaboration. Not a feature, De La featuring Be Real. And it's just some bullshit, he kicks a 16 and, and it's over, you know? Hi Maceo, um, I'm hoping this is a yes because I saw that you guys did a Nike, you know, couple of tracks a couple of years ago. And it really got me pumped up for another De La Soul album. I'm hoping that you say yes. Is there another De La Soul album coming Absol to make Absolutely, you? man. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You're going you're gonna to see a lot of cool stuff going down. Um, a lot of cool stuff going on. Right now, the fellas is um, moving along with this project uh, presented by these French cats. It's a concept album called First Serve. They play these two weird characters. I forgot the name of Dave's character, but Pasta's character is called Dean Witter. And I like his character because he's, he's totally out of character being this character. He, he's playing somebody who's supposed to be uh, a degenerate, pretty much a fuck up, smoking weed, you know, wearing a smoking jacket and a do-rag. It, it looks bugged out. And Dave looked like a broke-ass Rick Ross. <laughs> It's funny as hell. It's funny. It's funny. The project is called First Serve. It's funny, man. Um, I don't want anybody to assume that it's a De La Soul record and be disappointed. You really got to check out the concept of the whole project. Check out the visuals, the credit. It's, it's funny as hell, man. Um, and then I'm working on a project called DJ Conductor uh, where I'm producing new artists and my friends that I've been wanting to work with for the longest. I got a song with KRS-One, got a song with Freddie Fox, got a song with um, Mac Miller, uh, song with Fashion, uh, a couple of cats, man, that I'm inspired by, and finally doing something that um, I've been needing to do for a long time. And then you're gonna see us, of course, make a De La album, we're gonna also make a daylight album with Prince Paul. You know, a lot is going down. You know, a lot of good stuff is brewing. You know, so I'm, I'm in a good place where, where things are. I'm, I'm glad the internet did what it did to the record business. So it's gonna, the strong will survive. It's gonna show the true testament who's down for this music and who's not down for it. Because the, the checks aren't there like they used to be. You we gotta work that much harder for the check. And I love what I do, so I've always worked hard, you know. Um, you know, the era of the big checks, I wasn't really catching them anyway. <laughs> but, so I didn't, didn't miss anything. I'm still able to do what I love to do and catch what I'm catching, you know. And I like my place in it. I love where things are at with the internet and things being independent again. It's, it's going full circle. Because I was with Tommy Boy when they were independent and then they went major. Now they're back to being independent again and everybody's independent. 